Professor George is on the line and we're very glad to see him. Uh, Dr. George, thank you very much uh, for well, joining us been... again on the Mother of All Talk Shows. Now, let me start where uh, fairly adjacent to where you are. There's some more trouble brewing uh, in what they laughably call Kosovo. Tell us. Well, if one thinks of uh, the modern NATO, it came of age during the 1990s um, when it bombed first uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina and then uh, bombed um, uh, Yugoslavia. And uh, it was very pleased with itself, congratulated itself. And that's it. We found a, a new role for NATO, humanitarian intervention, you know, creating states out of uh, nothing. But as the years have gone by, NATO has looked back on its handiwork in the Balkans with a somewhat jaundiced eye because it hasn't really achieved what it wanted to achieve. This, the, the Bosnia and Herzegovina that came out from the Dayton Accords remains divided. There is this uh, entity, the Republika Srpska, which is uh, dominated by the, by, uh, the Serbs of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, who tend to look upon favorably on Russia. You know, they share the, the, the church, they have a very similar language. And then when it comes to Yugoslavia, they badly wanted uh, Serbia to recognize Kosovo and, uh, and, and accept that they've lost Kosovo. Kosovo is an independent state, and then Kosovo can be marched into uh, NATO, the EU, and uh, all the rest. But that hasn't really worked out. So NATO really over the past five, six years, have been very assiduously finding some way of rectifying these two uh, deficiencies, which is to get rid of this Republic of Srpska once and for all, get Serbia to recognize uh, Kosovo, and above all, to get Serbia and the Bosnian Serbs on board for the um, anti-Russian, Russophobic policy of uh, NATO and the EU. And so anytime you look for any of these problems, which is uh, you know, in Kosovo, it's being provoked by Albin Kurti, the, uh, the Kosovo leader, uh, with a view to provoking a NATO intervention. I mean, that, that's always what it does. They, if they can get another NATO intervention into Kosovo, it worked 25 years ago, they pushed the Serbs out, maybe they can uh, do it again just by saying, oh, the Serbs did this, Serbs did that. And of course, behind the Serbs stands big bad Putin. And in the meantime, the same thing is happening in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, where um, you know the, 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 uh, the, the, the uh, leader of the uh, Republic of Srpska, Milorad Dodik, could be arrested at any time. Uh, I mean, he's been threatened with arrest by the uh, office of the high representative, you know, somebody who is appointed by NATO to run the place. And he has threatened to uh, arrest a Milorad Dodik. And again, that could provoke uh, a NATO intervention should the Serbs rebel at seeing their leader arrested. You know, that could, that could be the provocation for a NATO intervention. So, so NATO is looking for ways to rectify its problem because the whole continent is now under NATO control. And, you know, there are only two holdouts, Serbia, and uh, and the Republic of Srpska in Bosnia and Herzegovina. There is, of course, Austria, and they are also trying to push Austria into NATO. But th that th this problem with the Balkans is just not going to go away, and it's annoying NATO no end. Although uh, in Hungary, for example, uh, the government is taking an increasingly independent line, uh, independent of uh, of NATO and of the EU. In Poland, where there are elections now, uh, you can't be elected unless you are taking a firm stand uh, on issues like uh, immigration, for example. The, this uh, tremendous influx of, uh, of Africans to Lampedusa in Italy, they plan on um, sprinkling these uh, these uh, African people who've arrived there uh, throughout all European countries. Poland saying not one of them will will come here. Uh, Poland has effectively broken relations uh, with uh, Ukraine now. So actually there are real life forces which are pushing more and more European governments 
into a different political position, aren't there? Well, we have to see whether that's the case. I mean, Poland, uh, the Polish government has um, a very tough uh, election fight on its hands. It's in, in three weeks' time. They are very worried about this new party, this confederal party that could challenge them and therefore push them out of power and then bring in this uh, Donald Tusk. So what are they doing? They're playing the Polish nationalist card and saying, yeah, we're not going to uh, give anything uh, to uh, Ukraine. Um, I would be very surprised if uh, Poland will stick to that policy. I mean, Poland is now so identified with Russophobia, with, with uh, leading the charge against Russia. I mean, Poland now sees itself as the leader of Europe. I mean, it's basically, it's pushing aside Germany and France and saying, we, we are the leaders of Europe. We are America's closest ally. Uh, look at how useless uh, Germany has been. Look at how useless France has been. We were aware of Russia from the beginning. So one has to take this with a pinch of salt, what, what this whole row between Zelensky and uh, Duda and Morawiecki, we'll see what happens after uh, the election. Same with this Lampedusa. I mean, remember, Giorgio Maloney was supposed to be the Mussolini, the return of Mussolini, and that was it. Italy was going to uh, join Hungary, and you know the whole NATO uh, endeavor would collapse. And then she just collapsed. You know, <laughs> you know, she was the one who just faded away. And now she's turned to Ursula von der Leyen and says, "Well, please help me uh, with this immigration problem." Well, that was her defining issue that was what got her into power and now you know under her rule immigration has massively expanded i mean she's worse on this issue than her predecessor uh, mario draghi the sort of the globalist in chief so one, one has to wait and see where, where things fall out the problem is is the electorates of europe are just not following the leaders the, the political leaders i mean the political leaders they they love this whole ukraine project um, but that's not what the voters want. I mean, here is um, in Germany where you have Annalena Baerbock, whose project, she's declared her project is to bring Putin to justice. That's it. That's that's going to be German foreign policy. That's the feminist German foreign policy, bringing Putin to justice. Quite how she plans to do this, she doesn't really uh, spell out. Uh, she's also said she doesn't care what the German people think. I mean, she's just going to pursue whatever she thinks. And that's really the attitude of so many uh, voters in, uh, of, of so many leaders in Europe and also in the United States, which is that, well, we we love this project, this Ukraine project. Uh, unfortunately, the, the stupid voters are not with us. As we know, you can love something too much. And uh, what uh, happened in the Canadian parliament, uh, which <laughs> from what I can tell is is now causing uh, tremendous ructions in the country. So what happens when you get carried away, George, isn't it? Uh, you, it, it, it. You, you construct this Man Manichaean narrative uh, and then you end up uh, with a standing ovation uh, to a Nazi murderer in the Eastern Holocaust. Uh, it, it's, it's a remarkable business, isn't it? It really is a remarkable business. So... You know, there they were, they're all clapping this 98 year old. Oh, what a wonderful old codger. You know, he was a, this great guy, you know, you know, an, an, an old man of the old school, you know, salt of the earth types. And then you know, they tell her, this was a Nazi. I mean, he, you know, he was, uh, you know, he was in this uh, Galician uh, division. He was trained in Germany. There are photographs of him, of him in Germany. He was being trained in, in 1942 in uh, Germany. So, um, and of course, uh, Zelensky was applauding him. Zelensky knows exactly who he was, because the Canadians who uh, took in a lot of these Ukrainian Nazis, pretending that they didn't know what what was what. Um, and remember, we have this uh, Krista Friedman, who um, her, her grandfather was an active uh, propagandist for the Nazis. When this came out, she immediately said, oh, this is Russian disinformation, you know, again, Putin this, Putin that. Then, of course, it turned out that it was indeed a Nazi propagandist. And they said, well, I didn't know. This is all nonsense. All the Canadians knew exactly who they were taking in. Christopher Friedland knew exactly who her grandfather was. Um, so but they pretend not to know, basically because they don't really care. I mean, they've adopted the... Um, 
the, the essentially the slogans of the 1930s, anybody who hates the Russians is on our side. You know, it doesn't matter. You're a fascist, you're a Nazi, you're genocidal, whatever. As long as you hate the Russians, you're on our side. And that, that's sort of a nice kind of uh, reversion to the attitudes of the 1930s and 40s. We have a saying here, George, never ask a man his wage, a woman her age, or a Ukrainian what their grandfather did in the Second World War. Uh, that might have been what was at play in the Canadian Parliament this week. Yes, well, that, 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 exactly. Um, but it is uh, quite striking how um, all these things are quietly forgiven and forgotten. I mean, no, you know, and it's not just Ukrainian. I mean, you talk about the Bolts. You know, the Bolts commemorate every year um, the Nazi collaborators. And I said, okay, that's fine. No, no, no problem there. Um, you know, then you then you have the uh, Ukrainians. You know, okay, no problem there. You have countries in Eastern Europe that are desecrating World War II memorials. I mean, almost every day, yet they're taking down, you know, yet another World War II memorial. Why are they taking down World War II memorials other than they want to, you know, extirpate the history of, uh, you know, liberation from the Red Army? So that, that's what they, why they're taking it down. So it has nothing to do with communism, or oh, because we don't like communism. Well, they're not, they're not taking down statues of Lenin, they're taking down World War II memorials. There were memorials to the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of uh, soldiers from the Red Army who died liberating these countries, and they just want to take them down. And that's just in, it's their attitude uh, shows that it's that that, that Russell phobia that uh, it very much goes back to the Nazi ideology. Notice Hungary doesn't do that. Hungary is, has left left all the um, World War II memorials intact. It's left all the World War II cemeteries intact. It's never done that. So you can see how certain countries and, and the Hungarians they, they have no love for the communists, but they always distinguish you know communist from you know, the Red Army, the, you know, the people who actually came and uh, sacrificed hundreds of thousands of lives uh, liberating them. Uh, turning to the war then, Professor, the uh, I thought at first when I saw these bombs, British supplied cruise missiles raining down on the Navy HQ, uh, the balloon is surely going to go up now. Uh, this is an inflection point in the war. Uh, but the balloon hasn't actually gone up. And indeed, some people say uh, these kind of attacks are merely performative public relations shows uh, to mask the fact that as everyone who knows now knows and increasingly says, the Ukrainian counteroffensive is done. It's over. And all that remains to be seen is when the Russians will go on the offensive. Which way do you see it? Well, I see it more that um, they want to inflict a humiliation on Russia. I think the, um, the NATO powers, and that means the United States, for them, this is a good boondoggle. They want to keep this war going. Um, they want to kill as many Russians as possible, drain Russia as much as possible, debilitate Russia as much as possible, and to diminish Russia's uh, claim to be a great power. Well, what better way of diminishing it by than by attacking Russian territory? I mean, this missile attack, not only was it a UK uh, a missile, um, there was a, you know, essentially, a, a, you know, this was guided by the United States. So there was a reconnaissance aircraft in the neighborhood. It was guiding. So it was essentially a, a U.S. attack on uh, Russian territory. And the U.S. goes back and say, hey, we crossed another red line and nothing happened. And there's, in fact, an article uh, in, the, uh, in the New York Times with some U.S. official anonymous saying, you know, gloating, hey, we've crossed so many Russian red lines, we just don't pay any more attention uh, to them. Because now... The article was about the fact that U.S. military hospitals are treating uh, U.S. mercenaries uh, who were wounded in Ukraine. In other words, you're wounded in Ukraine, you're taken to a, a U.S. Army hospital in um, in Germany. So essentially, they're treating uh, 
mercenaries as if they were U.S. Army personnel. Um, and then and people say, hey, well, is that a red line? I said, no, oh, well, you know, there have been so many red lines. But for them, it's it's a way to humiliate Russia. They think Russia is weak. They think Russia is afraid of uh, NATO. They think they are afraid of us. We are not afraid of them. They are uh, they they are afraid of uh, triggering a nuclear war. We are not afraid. And that that's the NATO. I, I think it's a very dangerous way of thinking, a very reckless and dangerous way of thinking. But I think that's the way NATO is thinking. They think we can get away with anything because the Russians are afraid of us. It's unlikely that the Russians are afraid of them, but it's also true that Russia has not. Uh, appreciably struck back uh, for what was, as you say, a very embarrassing, to say the least, attack on their naval HQ in Sevastopol. Yep, that's right. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I, I also don't think the Russians are afraid. The Russians are very cautious. There are, you know, they've always been very cautious. Putin is a very cautious man. He doesn't want to start a world war. Uh, the, the problem is that um, if this, this continues, there is going to come a point when Russia just simply can't uh, sit on its hands. I and mean, I don't know what that point will be, but they could come. I mean, you know, maybe at some point the United States might say that, well, we can transfer some small nuclear uh, battlefield weapons to Ukraine. They'll be very small, very, very small. Um, and, uh, and, you know, maybe that will be the point. But um, it's clear that they, they keep NATO, the United States, they keep escalating. They keep you know, moving, you know, you know, keep moving forward. And I think at some point this is going to end very badly.